Welcome to Winning the Game of Life. I'm your host, Shan Chhabra. If you're my regular listener and viewers, welcome back to the show. And if you're tuning in first time, welcome to the family. And I'm your friend, Shan Chhabra. And I expect you guys to come to my website. You can either leave a voice message from there, send an email, or talk to me through social media. Or on the website, there's a phone number. You can call me, talk to me or send me a text message so that I know where to take this show. I don't know what you like or what kind of guests you are liking. So today I have a very special guest here. He is a well-known entrepreneurial educator. He is founder of the School of Startups. His name is Jim Beach. And I don't want to say too much about him because I want him to introduce himself so that you hear from him. Welcome to the show, Jim. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I really appreciate you waking up this morning and talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> so how about we start with your like a background so that we really know who is Jim? Okay. Well, I started my first business when I was 24 years old. It was a children's technology business. And in seven years, I grew it to 700 employees with 89 locations in the United States and the UK uh, and Canada. And that business was really wonderful. It helped children learn that it was cool to be smart. And we had a lot of success with that and won lots of awards. It was one of the fastest growing businesses in the United States. And we you know, were in a lot of big newspapers and things like that. I sold that business in 2001. And started teaching entrepreneurship at Georgia State University and I was the top ranked professor 12 semesters in a row there. The thing that we taught in class is that anyone can be an entrepreneur. We're not big fans of creativity, risk, or passion. You know, normally entrepreneurs or entrepreneur want to be say that you have to be passionate and you have to have a lot of creativity and take a lot of risk and we don't really believe any of those things. So to prove this to my students, I made a bet with them, and I bet that in the semester, I could start a business, get it cash flow positive, repay all of my startup capital, and they got to choose the country and the industry that I would start the business in. I made that bet 12 semesters in a row and never lost, and we made some really great businesses. The first one we did was a furniture company out of the Middle East, and it was a very cool business. We took 100-year-old Killam carpets or rugs and turned it into the fabric for new armchairs, very high-end furniture, and sold it all over the country. It was very, very successful. I left Georgia State in 2009 and published a book with McGraw-Hill that went to the uh, bestseller list. It was number nine on all of Amazon. And that book sort of encapsulated our philosophy that anyone can be an entrepreneur and that it doesn't require taking a big risk. I, I like to see you start a business for under $500 if possible. And we show you how that can be done and how you can go about doing that. And since then, I've been doing radio. I'm on 12 AM FM stations around the country now, talking to great entrepreneurs every day. I also do a lot of fundraising for other businesses and help other businesses grow and do a lot of consulting and a lot of speaking around the country and the world. And as we were just discussing before we came on the air, I teach at IIT Bombay every year and enjoy that and love going to India every year. I've been six years in a row now. I'm also on a lot of judging panels. I do a lot of work helping select winning entrepreneurs and business plans. I'm a member of the entrepreneurship of our person of the year for our local chamber here in Atlanta, things like that. And I've been in a lot of the big time press I have been excerpted in the Wall Street Journal, Entrepreneur Magazine, CNN called me the Simon Cowell of small business, and so that's what I do. You're too young to have achieved all that. <laughs> I'm a lot older than I look. 
I, I, I know we will be spending the rest of the episode talking to you about your this entrepreneurial journey and what you just described like people should be fearless and like they should not worry too much about like this thing and that thing creativity and all those challenges and they should any almost anybody can become entrepreneur but yes. i still want to know like your background really from your childhood or something what, what made you what you are today like any special event or your family or background or th there must be something which a lot of your you, you are a radio host and all that but maybe there is there are some of the backgrounds nobody would have asked you uh I, before I was an entrepreneur, I got two master's degrees. I have a MBA and a master's in Japanese language. And I thought that I was going to do big business. I worked for Coca-Cola in Japan and loved that. I used to work for the Japanese government doing trade promotion activities back in the 1980s. That was my first job out of college. But as a child, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I never even thought about it. I, I wanted to work for Coca-Cola for the rest of my life and eventually become CEO of Coca-Cola. And there was a big event. Coca-Cola fired me and asked me to leave the building and decided they didn't want me around anymore, even though I had saved a ton of money for them and was doing some very good work for them. They decided that I had too much of an entrepreneurial uh, experience or personality and they didn't think that I would fit into the Coca-Cola, you know, philosophy and world very well, very well. And so they fired me. And it was the most devastating moment of my life. I thought I was going to work at Coke forever. And I had never even heard the word entrepreneur, I don't think. I, I had no desire to be an entrepreneur. It had never occurred to me. And it was very, very difficult to recover from that and to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And at this point, I was only 23 years old. And I thought life was over, that I, I have a very clear path in front of me. And now that path has disappeared. And so I became an entrepreneur because I really had no else, no idea what else I wanted to do. I tried to find a job, and everyone wanted me to go back to live in Japan, and I didn't want to do that. I was uh, hoping to get married, and it just wasn't the right time in my life for me to go back to Japan. And so I started a business because I had no other opportunities. There was nothing else for me to do. The only thing that I could do was start a business. I couldn't get a job. I was too young to retire. I was only 23. And so I became an entrepreneur by default. And at that time, you know, I had no idea what the path would look like, but it was certainly the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, that, that is a big, big change in your life. How you even have the guts and courage to do something like that? Like if you would have kept looking for a job, eventually you were going to find a job. So there must be something in your mindset or you were maybe too much entrepreneurial. You just discovered that. You know, I think it was probably the fact that Coca-Cola told me that I should be an entrepreneur, and I consider those really smart, good people, and I still do. I still love the Coca-Cola company. I think it's one of the best-run companies in the world. Of course, the CEO there now is a fantastic Indian man and is doing some amazing things. And when they told me that, it really changed my mindset about what I should do with my life. And someone came to me out of the blue and proposed a business idea. And I liked the idea but didn't like the person. I didn't want to work with that person. So I went off and did it by myself. It was the opportunity to buy a franchise. And I realized that the business idea was a very good one, but that the purchase of a franchise was just not right for me. I thought, I can do that by myself. I don't need your help to do that. I don't need your business plan to copy or your manuals to use. I can just go off and do this by myself. So that's exactly what I did. I decided to be an entrepreneur without a franchise. And that's sort of where my first belief in the importance of creativity came from. The business that I started was a copy of someone else's business. And, you know, I you know, you think, well, if it's a copy, it's not very original. You know, it doesn't have to be original. My business model was better than theirs. I executed the plan better than they did. I uh, was at more prestigious locations than they were. I had better partnerships than they did. 
And so I learned very early on that you don't need to have an original idea to be an entrepreneur. All you need to do is find an idea and execute it very well. And I, I learned something very important that entrepreneurship is about solving problems. It's not about creativity. And if you can find a problem to solve, people will gladly give you their money. And I started thinking about this. Well, I, I have a lot of problems. I, I have problems that need solving all the time. Sometimes I need new clothes, and that's a problem. Sometimes I want to buy a car because I don't want to walk a long distance. And so my problem is that I'm lazy and I don't want to walk downtown and so I buy a car so I can drive downtown and anytime that you have a problem there's an opportunity for a solution and a solution is a business and then I realized that everyone else has problems too sometimes they're bored and they need to go on vacation sometimes they need more education so they need to pay someone to teach them things and so if you can find a problem and solve it find a solution to that problem People will just give you their money gladly. And that's what my first business did. It took kids that were unhappy and made them happy. Well, parents will pay a lot of money if you make their kids happy, if you teach their kids that it's cool to be smart. And so I realized that creativity was not that important. And then afterwards, you know, I started that business with under $2,000 off of my credit card. I didn't have any money, so I couldn't spend any money. And the only way to start the business was with credit card loans. I, I discovered that risk is also not part of the equation. You don't have to take a bunch of risk, double mortgage your house, start with $100,000 that you borrow. Many, many successful, great businesses are started with five hundred dollars five thousand dollars and so that became another one of the rules that I operate under in my entrepreneurial experience I don't like to start businesses that take a bunch of money I like to figure out how to start them with no money if possible and so I discovered very quickly that risk is also not necessarily part of the entrepreneurial experience even though we all say entrepreneurs are risk takers that do creative things to start businesses that's a definition but it's not the best definition of entrepreneurship I like the definition better entrepreneurs are people that solve problems and get paid money for it I, I think that sounds better and then I discovered something else when I was making those bets with my classes and starting the businesses that I was using to teach these students how to do a business I realized that I was not necessarily passionate about the business itself I didn't like my furniture business from the Middle East I'm not interested in that however I love the lifestyle that goes with it I love the fact that I can stop at two o'clock in the afternoon and go to ballet practice with my daughter and then go to soccer practice at three o'clock and then not work the rest of the day or I can work 18 hours a day and make more money if I'm willing to work harder. I discovered that being passionate about the lifestyle is enough. That passion for the freedom, for the fact that I make as much money as I'm willing to work, all of those things are what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate that I get to wear whatever clothes I want. I don't have to report to the man. I don't have a J-O-B. I'm passionate about all of those things and so very quickly I added that passion is not part of the entrepreneurial experience as well so I believe that creativity risk and passion can be interesting and can be part of the entrepreneurial experience I don't believe that they're required and so because of that I think that anyone can go be a successful entrepreneur you know so many people are sitting on the sidelines sitting on the sofa saying I want to be an entrepreneur but I don't have an idea yet well then go on Google and type in free business plans and you'll find thousands of business plans that are being given away that you can copy people say well I can't take the risk right now of starting a business my two sons are about to go off to college and I really don't have any savings so now is not a good time again you can start a business cheaply and just because you think you need five thousand five million dollars to get started that's something you've imposed upon yourself 
Or people say, I haven't discovered what I'm passionate about. But when I do, when I figure out what I'm passionate about, oh boy, I'm going to go and take over the world. Well, maybe what you're passionate about is a great lifestyle. My office at home overlooks the swimming pool. I get to take the kids to school, and then I work in a beautiful office that has everything I need. And If I want to take a break and go walk the dog, I do. I'm passionate about an incredible lifestyle that everyone else I know is envious of. So that's a little of my entrepreneurial journey. Wow. Like, like the bottom line is it's the flexibility and freedom to do and not to do. You decide that. That's right. I decide every day if I want to watch TV or if I want to work, if I want to spend time with my four children or my wife. Uh, I get to go to Disney when I want to. I get to do whatever I want. So the freedom is what makes me happy. The opportunity to work harder and make more money. If I want to write another book, I sit down and write another book. So I decide what is important to me. That's an incredible opportunity and I'm very passionate about my lifestyle, not the businesses that I run. You know, I used to have a purse business, a female leather accessory business that sold purses and jackets and belts and things like that. Well, I'm not a clothes person. You know, I wear simple, basic clothes every day. I don't, I, I dressed up for you today. I, I put on a shirt with a collar instead of wearing a t-shirt. You know, uh, I'm not passionate about furniture or clothing, but I am passionate about making money and doing it in my own way with a lot of freedom, a lot of opportunity, and that's enough. I don't need to be passionate about clothing to run a clothing business. Whatever is coming out of that, you're just enjoying that. So why do you care? It's like a lady's purse or jacket or you're selling cameras or microphone or you're just doing radio show. It's the that's same right. Thing. It's the same That's entrepreneurial. Right. So, so what, what hold people back? Like they just look for excuses not to take the first step or something? Or is this, is this like a mindset or what, what is that? There must be something which can come out of this discussion. So some of the people who are just sitting on the sofa and not taking action, what, how, they should, how they should like it clear their head? It is an excuse. 72% of people in America say they want to be an entrepreneur. 10 or 11 percent of Americans are entrepreneur. That means we have 60 percent of the people that are afraid to act. And what they do is they use these three excuses. Well, I can't take the risk right now, or I'm not creative. I haven't had a great idea. But when I do, I'm going to really build an exciting business. These are all excuses, and these are how they explain why they are not being active yet. These are the ways that they simply avoid being an entrepreneur because they're afraid of it. And so I think that it is fear that people are afraid of the unknown. They don't know what to do first. They don't know how to get started. And so it's easier to sit on the sofa, sit on the sidelines, and then they don't fail. You know, people are very afraid of failure. I've had a lot of failure in my life. We haven't talked about that yet, but I've had a lot of failure. I've been in debt by millions of dollars. I've had businesses that went into bankruptcy. You know, all of these things are part of the experience. And just because you fail, that you know, that's the great thing about America. You can dust yourself off and start over again and try again. And I think that people are just afraid. And so it's easier to make an excuse for their inactivity than it is to get started and go try. I mean, unless I always tell people, pick up the right foot, take a step, and left foot will be in the air, and you will be moving. Like one of my friends, like I was interviewing somebody the, like a couple of month, couple of weeks back, and he said, Sean, no, nobody can steer a stopped car. Make a left or right, start moving. If, if, he, if you are going in the wrong direction, you will find it soon, and you will tweak it and turn right. And if you are going right, you will know that too. But if you are just sitting in a car and in a parking lot, it's not going to take you anywhere. That's right. So, so guys, you, you are listening, okay? Just wake up, get up. You know, you cannot just watch this like a TV show and just, just lay down on the sofa and rest. If, if you are just listening and not watching, just, just listening is not going to make you entrepreneur, you know? You have to take a step. And 
today is the day we got the one of the best entrepreneurial educator here so now how about jim we, we switch back to like your book and the, what do you teach and how many people you may have helped so far becoming entrepreneur well the book tell some of these stories it talks about the furniture company that's in the first chapter and it shows all of these lessons and as i said the book went to number nine so it sold very very well we also have an online learning center which is at schoolforstartups.com that has about eighty hours of videos talking about what we call low risk entrepreneurship and so we examine entrepreneurship all aspects of it from a very unique perspective if you don't have an idea we talk about how to get an idea if you don't have much money we talk about how to bootstrap and how to start your business with under five thousand dollars we teach you some of the tricks that you can use to get a business up and running for the very cheap amount of money that you may have. And so it's a you know a center designed to help people do all of the things that I'm talking about. We talk about how to get business plans and where to get them and you know how to steal other people's ideas. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, I point out that there's a thousand different companies selling hamburgers, right? There's McDonald's and Burger King and Crystals and Five Guys and White Castle and lots of different people sell hamburgers. So if you were to start a new hamburger business, are you still an entrepreneur? Yes, you are, right? So there's nothing wrong with taking someone else's idea and just making it better. And so far, we've had about 7,000 people who have gone through our program and have started businesses. So we're very, very excited about that. That's, you know, thousands of people out there creating hopefully 10,000 jobs for other Americans. So is your school too expensive? It's only $29 a month. And Not even a dollar a day. <laughs> that's right. And so if you, you know, if you don't have a job now, uh, you can watch the entire class you know, system in under a month and just pay $29. So uh, for, you know, 30 bucks, you could learn everything that you need to know. And we also talk about marketing and how to build websites and how to get on social media and use it effectively, how to build business with social media and email lists, uh, all of the steps of funding. We talk about friends and family and venture capital and angels, even though we don't really recommend it, we talk about that. And so every aspect of entrepreneurship, every single thing that you would ever need to know is part of the curriculum. And it's 80 hours designed to teach you everything you need to know. So do they, do they need to in invest more money to buy the books or anything or you just give them everything? Well, they, you know, the book and the online center, are, they have the same name, but you don't need both of them. You could read the book and then take the class and then you would buy the book for $9 and the class is online for $30. But if you do the video, you don't need the book. It's 100% uh, it's self-contained. So for $30, you get absolutely 100% of what you need. Oh, I mean, you don't ask them to go and buy whatever books you were teaching in MBA and all that and those expensive kind of books? 30 bucks all in. Wow, wow. Well, what an opportunity, guys. <laughs> You'll be putting all the links and all the information on the website and all over the places. In addition to your book, do you recommend any other book to people to read to become an entrepreneur? Well, you know, I interview authors every day on my radio show, and so I've encountered tons of great uh, authors and some of the fantastic books that they've written. You know, on the radio show, we've interviewed all of the New York Times best-selling authors and all of the, the latest things. Uh, and so I could recommend a hundred different books. You know, some of them I, I think are kind of stupid and I don't like, and I don't really want to say who those are, but there are some bad books out there too. And I don't believe, for example, that you can make a lot of money working only a very few hours a week. So I haven't really said this, but let me make this very clear. I work hard. I work long hours. And some days I get to work two hours, but then I need to work 12 hours on the next day or 18 hours on the next day. So I do believe it involves a lot of hard work. These books that 
are designed to motivate you and get you started. I don't really like those. I like the books that are more practical, that show you how to actually do things. So I would love for you all to learn how to build your own websites. You know, there's some great classes and some great books on how to build websites. Uh, I like some of the books that teach you that giving back to others is very important. Bob Berg and John Mann wrote a great book called The Go-Giver. Go Giver about how important it is to give yeah. back to other people. I love that book. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think that any of the books that are motivational, I'm not a big fan of. You know, so the these books that say, "Ah, oh, get you know, go walk on hot coals and do all of this." I don't think you need that. I think you need practical books that give you step by step knowledge of how to start a business. Those are much more realistic and honest to me. Um, but you know, if you go out there and just try to start with some of the great entrepreneurship books, I think that you'll find some really good ones. Uh, go on my radio show, School for Startups Radio dot com, and look at the people that I interview. Uh, almost all of those are great authors talking about really important stuff. I don't try to have the people on there that I think are full of BS. Good. Yesterday, I saw an email invitation from you. And I just grabbed it and booked it. I'm coming to your show next week, actually. That's right. I'm excited to have you. <laughs> good, good. So we are close to the show, but not really close to the show. And I still want to know a little more about like your daily rituals, you know, like in the morning, what time you wake up, what are the things you must do in the morning and some of your habits which may have helped you. I'm asking too many questions in one question so that you can answer those together. Right. Uh, I get up at 6.45 in the morning. Uh, I hate to get up that early, but I have kids that I need to get to school. And if it were up to me, I would sleep until 8 or 9 in the morning. I like to sleep late and go to bed late. But I get up at 6.45. I have my 4-year-old son at school by 7.20, so we get him up feed him, get him breakfast, you know, all of that kind of thing. Uh, so I take him to school at 7.20 and then I come home. Well, before that, I actually do some radio. So around 7 to 7.15, I do a few minutes of radio while my son is eating breakfast and I get the show ready for that day and send it to the radio stations. And then I take him to school, which is right around the corner. It's like a two-minute drive. And then I come back and I do a couple more minutes of radio and maybe build a little of the website for that day, for the radio show for that day. And then I take my daughter to daycare. I have a five-month-old daughter, and I get her to daycare by 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock, I come back and I start working. And so I do emails and all of that boring stuff, try to answer the emails that came in overnight and keep uh, on top of that. And then at 9 o'clock, I usually start interviewing guests for the radio show or go to meetings. I maybe go out and give a speech somewhere. I always take lunch and have lunch with one of my entrepreneur friends and try to you know, do a little bit of business during lunch and then back in the office in the afternoon from 1 until uh, 2.20. Uh, I do radio and you know, maybe write get some work done, maybe put together a PowerPoint for a business that I'm working on, actual you know, production. And then at 2.20, I go get my son from school. Uh, I spend a few minutes playing with him and give him an afternoon snack. And then around from 3 into 5, I do more work, more production, uh, either creating radio show, filming videos for the online learning center. I'm working on five new books right now, so I maybe do some writing. And then at 5 o'clock, I'll get, go get my daughter from daycare. We eat dinner, get the kids in bed by 7.30, and then spend a little bit of time with my wife. Right now, we're watching Game of Thrones, and so we watch an hour of television together every night. And then around 10 o'clock at night, I try to do some more work, maybe get some radio ready for the next day. Uh, last night, I spent three hours working on a new PowerPoint for a business that I'm working on with one of my friends and did that until about 11 o'clock. And then around 11, we go to bed. And then the next day, we repeat. 
how, how you get that much energy and excitement to do that, that many things like I'm, I'm, I, I could see like you are so much task oriented and everything is like you got so much discipline and doing so many things and it's still cool and calm and not jumping around. Uh, I just write down a list of things that have to get done that day and start working at the top and work my way down the list. I have a little dry erase board that's about uh, 18 inches by 12 inches and I write on the dry erase board my things to do for the day. It's my to-do list and I move it around wherever I am and cross things off and erase them as I get them done. But I'm never frantic. It's always very uh, you know, peaceful and uh, you know, it's not a, a hectic schedule. Um, I, you know, just sit down and try to get things done. The main thing is that I find is that so many people get lost in emails and checking their social media and things like that. You know, I, I do social media once a week and on Sunday afternoon, maybe while I'm watching a little football or something like that, or maybe when I'm playing with the kids and the kids are at my feet playing around, I will make all of my tweets for the week. I'll do all of my Instagram for the week. So, you know, I'm fairly active on Twitter and Instagram, but it's all done using scheduling software, HootSuite, H-O-O-T-S-U-I-T-E. I use HootSuite on Sunday to program all of my tweets for the week. And so it may look like I'm doing social media all week, but in fact, it's all done on Sunday afternoon. You know, on Saturday morning, there are certain things I always do. You know, it's a fairly methodic schedule, and I just repeat it every week. You know, some days I have a speech to give, so I don't do any radio. You know, it's, it's all very easy and scheduled. Um, and the most important thing is, I don't sit around doing emails all day because that I don't consider that production. I consider that a waste of time. You have to set time aside to produce work. So if you want to write a book, you have to write two hours every day. If you want to do a new business and go fund, you know, get fundraising for it, you have to build a PowerPoint and write the business plan. That means you need to put into your schedule two or three hours every day where you produce. You know. Uh, Work is the act of production, and I'm in the job. My job is to produce radio, to produce books, to write business plans. And so I sit down, and for two hours I work, and I actually produce something. And I don't get up until it's done. And, you know, if you use that as a rule, I think you'll get more things done. I don't sit there and check email and then Facebook and then write a paragraph. I write 20 paragraphs. And then maybe I will walk around and go give the dog some love. But then I sit down and write 20 more paragraphs, right? So uh, I think that the ability to get focused and to produce is one of the things that entrepreneurs need to focus on the most. You know, If I need to build a new website, I sit down and build it. I get it done, and then I get up. I don't wander around. I don't go on Facebook. I think Facebook is one of the biggest waste of time on earth. And these people that say, I need to check my social media, I think they're just idiots. You know, get, Don't spend time on Facebook. It is a complete waste of time. And that is the exact opposite of work. If you're on Facebook, it's called wasting time. And so I don't do those sort of things. You know, I love television. I, I enjoy stupid stuff on television like the History Channel and things like that. And so I'll turn the television on and write for a couple of hours or do, you know, a website creation or write a business plan but with the TV on. But I'm not really paying attention to it. It's just background noise. And so I do have the ability to focus and get things done. And I think that's one of the most important things that entrepreneurs need to work on. So no, nobody should be doing multitasking. No, I don't really believe in multitasking. That means you're doing a lot of things, you know, very poorly. Um, if I'm writing a book, I sit down and write the book. I don't write the it, book and then check email and then check Facebook. I do the book. So, for example, yesterday I created, I think, a beautiful PowerPoint with pictures on every page, charts and graphs in three hours, 16 slides, and it probably didn't take full three hours, probably took two and a half hours, 
and it's now investor ready after two and a half hours. You know, one of my big pet peeves is when I go to a chamber meeting or I go to a entrepreneurship club type meeting and I ask someone what are you doing and they say well I'm writing my business plan and I say oh that's cool and then two months later you see them and they're still writing a business plan two months later no a business plan takes 20 hours to write maybe 30 hours you know and then you're done 20 or 30 hours is called half of a week you know so I don't believe that these people who take months to produce something. Those are not going to be successful entrepreneurs. That's not the way it works. When I got my contract with McGraw-Hill to write my first book, I sat down and wrote it in three weeks. 200 pages in three weeks. And then I was done. And then there was some editing and stuff like that and more important, learning to market the book. And that takes years. You know, I've been marketing the book for you know four years now, getting more people to buy it. But get, sit down and get it done. You know, you don't get to spend months on something. Yeah, I mean, people have to be working wholehearted, and wholehearted is wholehearted. There's no other way. And multitasking came, I think, when Microsoft brought, I think, Windows after 3.2, I think Windows 95 or something. It was, it was able to do open two softwares at the two applications at the same time, and the word multitasking came. And our brain, I don't think, was ever designed to keep up with whatever is like multitasking is going all around. So our brain is not ready for that. I don't think it, it will ever be ready for multitasking. So when you are taking multitasking, you are taking part of attention from one side and putting on another. So you are just really doing, it's almost like being handicapped on whatever you're doing there. I agree. You know, I have multiple software open, so I'll have a PowerPoint open to build a good PowerPoint presentation and I have Safari open to do research on the internet and Paint open to build slides but all of that is designed to build the PowerPoint presentation at the same time I'm not going on and checking the news I'm not checking my email uh, I, I also turn my phone off and if I'm working I don't answer the phone you know, so even if I have several different programs running, they're all designed to help do the same thing, which is build a beautiful PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, so you are not doing multitasking. Th those are the requirements, but computer is doing multitasking. But right. the, the minute people heard the word multitasking when Windows 95 came, everybody th think it's cool. I can do multitasking. I'm so smart. Right. And it's no different than like being on the phone all day and driving around and just keep forgetting the directions. Exactly. <laughs> Very good. We are really enjoying this. And maybe we would like to invite you one more time. I had to ask my listeners and viewers, send me some feedback, you know, so that I bring Jim back again. So, I hope so. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. Like, I, I'm enjoying, I'm so mesmerized, I'm lost, and you have so much knowledge, you are the educator, and I'm learning a lot of things from myself. I'm an entrepreneur, so, so I, all my life, that's what I did. And I'm really, really enjoying. You are a professional with all the professional background, and you run a school, you run a radio show, what else? I mean, you have given so much knowledge to all of us today, is there any last minute last minute advice to the people who are on the fence and they're still not sure they should be entrepreneur? Well, just don't be afraid. Go give it a shot. You know, uh, if you limit the amount of money that you start with, your risk is very low. So I was talking about the Middle Eastern Furniture Company. I started that business for about four thousand dollars. Each chair sold, you know, they were very unique works of art with 100-year-old fabric. Each chair sold for $2,000, $2,500. So to repay my startup, I only had to sell two chairs. And if you limit your startup capital, a lot of the fear of entrepreneurship goes away. And so I just want to encourage people to rethink entrepreneurship. It's not risky it's only risky if you let it be risky. If you limit your risk and move forward with an understanding, I'm not going to spend more than $5,000 to start this business, your chances of success are very, very good. I'll quickly tell a story. One of my uh, brother-in-laws, he's a step-brother-in-law, he started a bar for about $7,000. 
and it was a dump of a bar. You know, his dream in the in life was to be a bar and restaurant owner, but he only had seven thousand dollars, so he rented an old barber shop, and he took seven thousand dollars and he added a tiny, tiny bathroom that was very ugly. It was you know concrete walls, cinder block walls. The floor was linoleum, the same linoleum that the barber shop used. He bought all of his furniture from a flea market. It didn't match. It was ugly. And he made money the first weekend, enough money to buy more beer for the second weekend. Well, about five years later, someone moved in across the street and spent $3 million building one of those beautiful restaurants with the big brass beer brewing equipment and all of that. Think about this. How many beers do you have to sell to recoup your $7,000 investment? Not that many, maybe 1,000 beers. How many beers do you have to sell to recoup a $3 million investment? Like 700,000 <laughs> beers, right? Of course, my, my brother-in-law is still in business 20 years later. He owns seven bars and restaurants now, some of them very nice. And the $3 million place across the street went out of business within six months. Sometimes the path is to do things the cheap way and then build from there. And so I think that's a great little story for us to wrap up on. Oh, not only that, I was going to still say one thing, like other people don't have to wait until like they get fired <laughs> or or, or, oh, lose, right. or lose their, their regular earnings. They should start on the side. They can just start and try and test different ideas and eventually in place of getting fired, they can quit. <laughs> That's right. I love that. Don't, yeah, go ahead and get started now. That's the most important thing. Do something now. Okay. Thank you, my friend. He enjoyed it. Thank you for coming. And thanks Thank for all the much. advice. And I'll be sending a lot of my listeners and viewers to your school. And I may, so. maybe I should get some admission there. I want to come. I'm excited to go and watch some videos there, you know. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Have a nice day. Talk to you. All right. Bye-bye. Do not throw that old phone away. Your trash may be hidden gold. We want your old device and will pay top dollar for it. Our process is as easy as one, two, three. We offer no obligation sales. If you have a problem with the price that we gave you, we will return the device to you at no charge. Fast payment, free shipping, free data wipe, risk-free transaction. Buybackqueen.com.